Welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. Thank you for joining us and thank you to Mr. Ben Armstrong, BitBoy Crypto, the one, the only, the largest crypto YouTuber there is uh, for good reason, incredible format, incredible sense of community and in, in a, in a great message about um, you know, helping people out with their financial security, which I really respect. So I'm very honored that you're here with us today. How are you doing today, Ben? Well, I'm doing really great. And, uh, you know, certainly thanks for that introduction. You know, we, we definitely do like our mission statement at BitBoy Crypto is empowering people to find financial freedom through crypto assets. And uh, that's what we like to do. But I got to say, I haven't had a cigarette in like 15 years. But man, <laughs> seeing you over there, you know, having fun smoking a cigarette in the metaverse. I don't know. Maybe it's a whole other uh, de yeah, you know, look, level look. of debauchery. Cigarettes in the metaverse, they're you know, they still have no idea what the uh, what the ramifications are for that. So, you yeah, know, it's, so, it's like the 1950s almost, you know. Yeah, yeah. So smoke them if you got them. Um, so this is episode 14 with Ben Armstrong. And because Ben is a big Atlanta Falcons fan, this is, I guess, the Eric Weems episode, right? Oh, would you, gosh. Would you yeah. think Eric? Eric is the best number 14 you guys have had, right? Eric Weems is the best number 14 we had. Yeah, I miss Eric Weems, man. He was a really good returner. And, uh, you know, he's actually the last really good returner that we had. I mean, we, we, we like pretty much, you know, are last in the NFL and kick return yards every year. Even when we had Andre Roberts for one season, who does phenomenal everywhere else he goes. Right. So, yeah, but we a uh, uh, big football fan. Okay, I can get into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I love football. I'm a I'm a Miami Dolphins fan, okay. which is which is a very difficult thing to sort of admit, but it's the truth. I've I been can a, relate. Yeah, I've been a Dolphins diehard forever, but you can't really relate because you were just in the Super Bowl a little while ago, you know. Like well, we, yeah, but we we had the greatest <laughs> sports collapse in history, you know. So right. you guys had Dan Marino and did win a Super Bowl. We had a 28 to three lead and did win a Super Bowl. Right, so, right. We, we we have 80s nostalgia to fall back on. At least you had a Super Bowl like within like some. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was email when you had a Super Bowl, like you know. <laughs> yeah. Good point. You know, you know. For me, it's been a disaster. But yeah. anyway, um, look, I, I'm, I'm, haven't been in the YouTube space for a very long time. Working over at Complex, then doing Collider, and and and, and knowing how difficult it is to build YouTube channels. I mean, like when when I started uh, working on Hot Ones back in 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 uh, in Complex. You know, we had no idea, you know, that, you know, that it was going to blow up. And it mm. wasn't through a lot. It was through a lot of hard work to actually get that audience there and to figure out how to bring people in. Same thing with Collider when we were doing movie talk and all this stuff. I'm so impressed by the scale of the community that you've been able to put together over at BitBoy Crypto. Can, can you give me a little bit of the background of how you got into the media space or, or yeah. how this became a language for you? Yeah, so... You know, initially I tried to create a YouTube channel back in, I think it was probably 2015 or 2016. And I had been like doing side hustles for a long time, like trying to find the one thing I had a really successful business, like 2010, 11, 12. And then it, it kind of went away the dinosaur for a lot of different reasons. It's how I got into crypto. It's a long story, but I've been trying side hustles ever since then to really try to find the thing where I was going to hit a come up. And, you know, YouTube was one of these things that I always felt like I could be pretty good at. I always, you know, very, very, you know, polished public speaker and, you know, did, done a lot of that. And I thought it was a great avenue for me, but I can never come up with the idea. So one day I came mm. up with this idea to do uh, subscription box reviews, like unbox mm. therapy kind of deal. And because it was a really underserved niche at the time, there was really only one or two big ones. And, you know, kind of like I saw in crypto in the beginning and I tried it and I was awful. It was so terrible. I learned <laughs> how to edit. I couldn't ever grow the channel. I got sick of subscription boxes. I was like, why am I reviewing jewelry? This doesn't make sense. Like, I don't wear jewelry. You know what I mean? And so like, I just wasn't passionate about it. So I said, I was never going to do it again. Well, a couple of years later, I met um, a, a friend of mine, Dusty Porter. He's got a really large YouTube channel, like 350,000 in the tech space. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found out he did YouTube. I didn't know he did YouTube. I just knew him from kind of like, you know, some, some mutual friends. And I was very interested. And so we had kind of started working on this channel together and it did, it started doing okay. We had a thousand subscribers. It, it had seven or 800 before I came into it. So sure. we grew it a little bit. And, uh, you know, the thing that happened was I started moving into crypto. And so it was a tech channel and I wanted to start doing crypto videos. So we kind of hit an impasse where, you know, I, I just decided like, Hey, this was a good opportunity. I appreciate all the help and kind of putting me, uh, you know, showing me how to do this the right way. But like my passion is in crypto. And that's when I really learned that like 
you got to do what your passion is. If you're not doing mm. what you're passionate about, you're not going to be able to build a community. They're going to be able to see through it. You can't do things only for money. You have to do it for bigger goals, bigger ideals, bigger, bigger passions. And so that's what led me to create this YouTube channel is I was just so passionate about crypto. I needed an outlet to be able to talk about it. I only had one other friend that was really in crypto, Justin Williams, who's now my uh, VP of NFT development behind Pluto mm. Alliance and a lot of stuff we do. Um, he's my only friend I had to talk about crypto with. He came up with the name BitBoy. BitBoy right. is a cartoon superhero. And eventually <laughs> people would come on my show and they would call me BitBoy. And that's how I kind of got the nickname or whatever. Right. Uh, but it was always supposed to be like a comedy channel, like animated cartoon series in the beginning. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's what it all started out as. If you go and, in, 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 you know, reverse filter my video. So you go back to the beginning and see it was very, you know, very basic animation. I didn't know what I was doing really, but I was trying hard, but it was the beginning of the bear market. So people didn't really want that stuff. And so Justin was like, man, you just need to start, you know, mm. so much about crypto, just start doing news videos and talking about crypto and educating people. And that's kind of what led me into, you know, eventually the style that we do. And it was a lot of hard work and a lot of year, two years of nothing. Two yeah. years of absolute nothing. Nobody cared who I was. I remember there was another YouTuber uh, who I had some some drama with early on, and he came on into my into my comments one time and said, "You're nobody. You're never going to be anybody. I don't even know why you're making videos." And wow. that comment right there, like it really fired me up. You know, that's awesome. So it really fired me up. Like that's not true. I'm going to be somebody, and so I just stuck with it, even though nobody was watching. And eventually, things really uh, took off. And you know, we we've always tried to do things very community based. We have the Bit Squad, which Bit that's Squad. It, it is. Bit Squad was initially the name of BitBoy's collection of superhero friends. That was the Bit Squad, right? The wow. one I came up with the idea for everything, and so it very easily translated over to. It's a great. It's a great branding name, you know, Bit Squad. So, um, it all worked out really great, and we're really proud of our community. And uh, you know, we just keep on trying to uh, do what we can to lead them in the right direction and shepherd them. Yeah. So you know, you guys stream. Um, I believe it's every day. If I'm sorry, if I'm getting that wrong, Monday through Friday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Monday through Friday, eleven thirty a.m. And I, I listen to it in the background because it feels, to your point, like you're having a conversation with your buddies about, yeah. you know, the crypto space. And the cool thing about it is that you're way more um, structured because, you know, you have the sidebar thing and you're going through very specific topics. So you can count that there's really going to be no major news in the crypto space that you're not going to get right. if you give it the time. And the way that you guys do the format, you know, it, it's it's just it feels like a conversation. It feels like a conversation between you and the community. You know, it's a lot of fun and sure you get the drama here and there and that does, you know, good for clicks and stuff like <laughs> that. But, but ultimately the intention is really solid. Um, I got into crypto through, uh, a, you know, very strange, uh, kind of circumstances. Me and my buddies were really into like conspiracy websites and stuff like that. And, and we started hearing about this currency that was being used on the Silk Road mm -hmm. to buy to buy drugs and acid and you know you know cocaine and all kinds of stuff. And that was how we first heard about Bitcoin. And this was 2011, late 2011. Yeah. Um, so so we went to MT Gox and bought our first Bitcoin. And the price at the time was nine bucks. Yeah. You know, so you know it was the you know the early days. And MT Gox, for the people that don't know, was a Magic the Gathering site that uh was the first kind of public or not you know not 90 percent of the volume was running through there yeah which is in, in you yeah. know incredible um what was your first introduction to bitcoin yeah so not uh not much different other than it didn't involve drugs uh i, so, I mean i didn't do drugs i just heard about it through <laughs> I, the drug I, I thing. <laughs> well just, we know there was the big uh the big i think it was a gawker article is a big gawker article that came out uh, back when that was a thing, uh, before Hulk Hogan and Peter Thiel took that thing down, I think that was the <laughs> website where it was kind of like a buzz, you know, a buzz yeah, yeah, kind of yeah, deal yeah. where they had a big article in 2011 that came out about uh, all all the crypto usage on Silk Road. And Silk Road certainly played a gigantic role in, you know, really the success of Bitcoin. I mean, it is kind of a black mark, obviously, for a lot of reason, and it still sure. continues the illicit criminal activity arguments, even though it's 0.1 percent of the of the overall activity on you know Bitcoin transactions, but you know, what happened for me is I was using one of these side hustles I was doing. I sold event tickets and the event ticket. This was the successful business I had very early oh, on. And what happened is, is Craigslist. I, I, I had an auto poster for Craigslist where I would post ads. I was posting like 800,000 ads a day across Canada and the United States for tickets. And they had an auto poster and it was great. I loved it, but it was against the terms of service of Craigslist. So Craigslist sued the guy. His name was Yuri mm. and he was in the Ukraine 
And they sued him. And since he was in Ukraine, he wasn't going to come over to America and answer the charges. So ICANN took down his website. And when they took down his website, on the back end, they ensured that all of his payment processors were gone. And so a lot of people got in, you know, buying drugs. I was buying software. So I, I had mm. to, he eventually started taking Bitcoin. The guy's got to be a billionaire by now. He's got to be a billionaire, I, I really believe, uh, based on, you know, all the, the early days of Bitcoin. So 2011, um, November 2011 was when I got the email they were going to be accepting, or 2012, excuse me, when they were going to be accepting Bitcoin. My first Bitcoin purchase was uh, $400 worth of Bitcoin. December 12th or 13th of uh, 2012, and the mm -hmm. price was about $12. Uh, I think it was like 27 Bitcoin. Yeah, I think it was about 27. Maybe it was 37 Bitcoin, whatever Incredible. it is. Yeah. yeah, for 400 bucks. You know, and so over yeah, that yeah. first year, uh, I spent about $10,000 on Bitcoin, but I was using it as a currency, what it was supposed right. to be. So I wasn't right. holding on to it. 2013, fast forward to November when the price shot up, beginning of the bull run, it went all the way up to $200. It, it would go up to a thousand, but at $200, I had some money in account and I checked it and it was like suddenly worth thousands. And it was like a very minimal amount that I had left that I had in the account. And so I sold it for two or three thousand dollars somewhere mm -hmm. in between there. And I thought I had made the biggest win ever. I, I know. Like, I have a oh similar my gosh, story. Out yeah, of yeah, nowhere. Yeah. I just made this out yeah. to my family on vacation. You know, we paid off a couple bills, whatever. And then, of course, you know, that's worth, you know, a million dollars now or whatever. It sure, is, so. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was there. I, I, um, that, that initial purchase that I made went up like you're saying to like it was like a thousand or eleven hundred or something and then it started dropping mm. um and then when it hit six hundred i sold all of it you yeah. know and and i i thought i'd made a way you know yeah. like a bandit you yeah. know but hundred percent yeah. i've also bought cars with bitcoin in 2017 yeah. that was another disaster the biggest that you know and, and like that that actually brings up an interesting point that I've, I've spoken with a few other folks on the podcast about is that do you see bitcoin as a currency or do you see it more as a piece of real estate or like you know how do you look at bitcoin when it comes to its its inherent value and how that value gets yeah. uh, uh, exchanged between people well michael saylor would tell you it's a uh, digital real estate that that's what he would say you're you're, you're staking a claim on the network i you, you know I, I look at it a little bit different you know he gets he, he gets pretty deep in the weeds i like michael but yeah. Um, he's been on the show several times, uh, you know, appreciate him coming on. That's his standpoint on it. Then you got other people, your Bitcoin maxis that tell you, no, it's a currency. It's going to be the reserve currency. It's going to take everything. It's a commodity. I mean, I think it's very clear what it is. Mm. Uh, it's a commodity at this point. It is digital gold. Um, now, will it ultimately end up having a lot of the same qualities from a financial investment that gold has? I'm not sure. Uh, in my opinion, gold is going to turn more into the value of gold is going to actually be in its use in technology in a hundred years. It's not going to be, yeah. I, I believe is a precious metal because we're running out of gold for technology. That's why they want to get into space mining and all kinds of stuff where there's, you know, enough gold to give everybody on earth, you know, $9 billion worth of gold, I think on a, on, you know, a, a, a asteroid out there somewhere. But uh, <laughs> the point, that's true. That is true. I think it's like not <laughs> uh, an, enough gold on one asteroid. I think it's floating around Jupiter or uh, really? Saturn. Yeah, there's enough gold on one asteroid to give every person on Earth $9 billion worth of gold. Now, wow. obviously, supply and demand, that's not really a you know a possible scenario, but you, there's a lot of gold out there. Technology, we use so much gold in iPhones and you know the, the parts for iPhones and stuff like that, that that's where the value will be. And I think Bitcoin is what's going to replace gold as that store of value. Mm. It will be different. I think there will be more volatility with Bitcoin even in 10 or 20 years than gold has today. But that's how I see it. Uh, you know, we call it digital gold just because we don't have another better thing to compare it to. But ultimately, it is a commodity. It's not, you know, it's not going to be a currency. I think there is a potential for us, like we have gold-backed stable coins. I think we can have Bitcoin-backed stable coins, and those could ultimately, you know, in 50 years become the reserve currency of the world. I think that's definitely possible. But, you know, Bitcoin is a currency. I think El Salvador, while their tourism is up 30%, based right. on their Bitcoin law, which is great. Good for they, them. Good for them. Ultimately, the people that live there, you know, if they're going to spend, you know, uh, $100 on a mo or if they're going to spend $10 on a mojito and then down the road realize that mojito was worth, you know, four or five, six hundred $600, they're going to be, you know, really wanting to pinch their Satoshis there. So I, I, I believe that ultimately El Salvador will be a fail in terms of getting it going as a currency. I think we're going to learn a valuable lesson there. All for it. We love what they're doing there. But uh, I, I think, especially in a place as a third world country, like the people, sh 
are going to regret the same way you and I regret spending our Bitcoin. They're going to regret the same way. Yeah. Yeah. I was listening today and I liked your little uh, oh, Paraguay um, Par joke. Yeah. On Our Paraguays. <laughs> Paraguays. Yeah. Paraguay. That's the gas fee. You know, we yeah. cut it in half and call it Paraguays. Yeah. So so that's a good segue for like my next thought. So when, when I was early into crypto and, and, and we were, you know, all fascinated by the concept of, you know, this network that rewards the people that keep the network up every so often with this currency. And that's the reason why the servers are up. And that's why the reason why the servers won't go down. And then there came this innovation where this one kid who was really pissed off because uh, Blizzard messed up his World of Warcraft account, you know, you know, uh, um, started his own little war against, you know, centralized uh, uh, companies and launched Ethereum with the concept that you can actually use some simple computation on top of the blockchain and ethereum was born and the smart contract was born and if the use case for bitcoin was the black market the use case for ethereum back in you know when it first launched was this idea of the ico of launching your own mm -hmm. company of starting your own token basically youtube for currencies it was easy to create your own currency what was your kind of introduction and feel into ethereum when you first started hearing about the smart contract revolution yeah. i was really turned on by it <laughs> you know like i mean <laughs> yeah. like this is what really got me deep 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 into crypto to where there was no looking back because if we go back and we look at, at the story i i shared earlier about kind of how i got into crypto with the craigslist and stuff like that you know number one like the guy had all of his all of his stuff taken you know, he had his payment right. processor taken. He had his website taken. We see, you know, Parler had their stuff, you know, uh, sure. taken because of censorship. Well, it wasn't because of censorship in reality. It was because, you know, uh, Facebook and Twitter don't want competitors. And then yeah. they coerced with Amazon and coerced with Apple to make sure that they were able to get them out of the app store. Well, similar thing happened to that guy early on. Like, that's centralization, right? Where somebody mm. can come in and take stuff from you that's yours that you worked for. Uh, you know, you're not necessarily violating laws. You're violating a term of service. This isn't a law, you know, sure, but yet yeah. because you can't answer in court, they're taking everything away. Then we moved to why my ticket biz business failed. Eventually, Craigslist made a decision overnight that, you know, they took our section where we posted ads from free to $5 an ad. And if you remember what I said earlier, like 800,000 ads a day, right. you can't do that at scale at $5 an ad. You have people up there that are making decisions for everyone without taking everyone into consideration. And 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 I I really I'm always kind of careful when I talk about this subject, mm. but the YouTube shooter, when you take the YouTube shooter into consideration, what she did, she had a YouTube show. No, no, luckily she was a bad shot. She didn't kill anybody, so nobody died at this. Mm. But YouTube overnight removed her monetization with zero reason for telling her why. Mm. And she had nothing to fight back for. She tried to appeal. They wouldn't listen. You can't talk to a person. That's centralization at its finest. Yeah. And what does that lead? That leads people to be so upset because they have no route to try to defend themselves, no route to talk to a human. Everything becomes very, uh, you know, screen oriented to where everything's algorithms. Here's, here's something that most people don't realize. If you have a YouTube channel and you get in trouble with YouTube and you get a strike or you get your channel your channel taken or something like that, the, the big frustration point is, what did I do? Right. You don't know. They'll give they've got about eight to ten categories approximately that they say, well, you did something that fits in this violate in this category. You had a violation here. They can't tell you. A lot mm -hmm. of people think it's because they don't want to tell you. No, 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 no. The YouTube algorithm is 100% AI driven and not one person at YouTube actually knows what you did. No right. one knows what you did. It's not that they're hiding it from you. The algorithm triggered it. They don't even know. And so everything's so algorithm based and centralized based. And we look at what Facebook did, the Cambridge Analytica scheme, what they're doing with, uh, you know, meta and stuff like that. And it's scary. Centralization is scary. And that's why I love Ethereum. I love Web3. I love decentralization. I love what they're doing. I, it, and it just rang so evident to me because I had, there were really dark times for me when my business failed because of that decision of Craigslist, where I thought like, man, I sure would like to go to San Francisco and go to the Craigslist office, you know, not right. like I want to go in there and knock on the door. I want them to feel my pain and there's nobody to feel it, you know? Right. And so I understand what centralization can do to a person as we move to this more, you know, uh, internet based life or digital life. We're losing the face to face. We're losing the customer support. 
and the businesses are getting rewarded for not doing customer support. Look at look, phones, phone mm. phone service in the United States. You got Verizon, you got T-Mobile, and you got AT&T. You have no other choice. Every person I know has been with all three at some point in their life, and they sure. hate all three of them. Right. There's no competition. There's no there's no reason for them to improve their customer service. We've been dealing with it here for months. Like we can't even get to our own uh, bill that we can't get to our own account to pay without calling them and <laughs> right. going to seven people. And they have no customer service. And it's awful. Centralization is just so bad. And it's getting worse. And Web3 and decentralization is our only chance that we have. It may not work, but it's the only chance we have to, uh, you know, save ourselves from living in, uh, you know, a uh, 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 dystopian world when it comes to service. Wow. Yeah, no, uh, completely. And you've, you've just uncovered so many different rabbit holes. I'm just trying to see which one I go down because there's so many good ones in there. Um, you know, sticking kind of with the game uh, side of stuff and, and this whole kind of, you know, metaverse NFT explosion, um, you know, the, the analogy that I like to think about is that if you have a house um, and your house happens to have a crude oil reserve, um, that people could come in and mine your oil as much as they want, and they have zero obligation to to compensate you for it whatsoever. You know that that's kind of the Web two yep. paradigm where you know YouTube and Facebook and whoever um, can can just keep mining you and feeding their social graph, and you thank them for it, and you protect them, and you consider them virtuous, and all these different mm -hmm. things, and you don't actually get any real intrinsic value for it where when i look at web3 and i would love to get your kind of personalized definition of, of web3 because everybody just like love and freedom and all this crap yeah, everybody has different definitions for it for me i look at web3 i look at um the concept of the metaverse as true digital ownership has to be the most important piece of the equation if you join a service if you're part of a video game and you're just renting your character in their world a la Fortnite, you have zero ownership. You know, there, there's there's nothing web three or metaverse about it. You know, the fact that, you know, I I can use this ape um that you know that yeah, you know, it's part of the culture and there's definitely big companies that are getting in with Yuga Labs and doing all that kind of stuff. But ultimately I can leverage this ape and create other things with it without worrying about intellectual property rights. I do feel yeah. a sense of ownership um, and, and composability with it. How do, how do you look at this whole Web3 definition? Yeah, I mean, basically, I just like the word, you know, I've said it, you know, six or seven times, like decentralization. Like that's right. the word to me that really drives it home. You can look at different, like you said, there's a lot of different definitions. I, I compare it to actually like uh, generations, you know, like Gen right. Z, millennial. There's no like governing body that decides those years. It's actually kind of like arbitrary. That's where a good you point. Think you fall, a good you point. Know? There, you know, there, there's no age identification, you know, generation, yeah. to, you know, council. Don't tell the government they'll make one. But, you know, <laughs> when, when it comes to Web3, like I look at it as decentralized digital ownership ran by creators in a world where we're all creators. Mm. So the Web2 was very corporation based. You know, it was very like large entities moving in. When you think about anybody that started off small, uh, you know, kind of in the early days of the Internet, uh, you know, your your Mark Cubans, your Facebooks, uh, I forgot the guy's name, but like founder of Napster, like they either get shut down or they get bought and it all feeds up to the overlords, you know, to the mm -hmm. tech overlords. This is a different kind of system to where we're all I just think it boils down to we we are coming from a time where we didn't understand what the digital ownership was even possible. And now we've been on the internet long enough and we have the technology there to know that we don't have to live in a world where Facebook takes all of our data. We can put a stamp, we can put a, a stamp on our own digital data and say, if you want it, I'll sell it to you, but that's mine. You know, right. this is not Mark Zuckerberg's data. This is my data. So you have things like Bray Browser that have, you know, kind of attacked that system and, and mm. found some good ways to reward creators. And, um, you know, uh, obviously also people that are willing to view ads in a decentralized way. So I, I think Bray Browser is a really great kind of example of something that's Web3 based. Um, you know, I don't know if everyone would consider it Web3 based. I mean, it has a lot of Web2 operation, but the way that they store the user data to feed the ads is very important because if you went to Facebook right now, 
uh, it, or let me rephrase that. Not you, Mark. Let's let's say if Mark Zuckerberg walked mm-hmm. into Facebook today, he could go to whoever is in charge of their, uh, you know, uh, IT or their tracking or their data and say, hey, listen, I want Mark Fernandez's information. Can you give me every single thing, every <laughs> data point we have on Mark Fernandez? He can get that. Yeah. Yeah. With, Bra- with Brave Browser, there's no one to walk in the door to ask for it. And then there's no one there to provide it. No one has it. Your data is still stored on the network, but it's it's stored in a decentralized way so that all your data points are kind of spread out and no one can pull all that data together except for the algorithm that serves you ads. And then after it serves it to you, it kind of disperses again. And so I think that's, you know, that's kind of my, I think it's a great example of the way Web3 is going to work, honestly. Yeah, you know, um, it's really interesting because I've been around this media software thing for, you know, forever. And the question that keeps popping up in my mind as I continue my entrepreneurship of building new companies and stuff is the idea of the intellectual property rights and, um, you know, how how much can you actually protect and still follow Mm -hmm. these kind of ideals, right? And like, Back when I launched my first ICO back in the day, you know, Bancor, which is still, you know, one of the first DeFi platforms still out there, still doing its thing. You know, we, we always used to kind of kid around amongst ourselves that if you can't fork it, it's not decentralized. Yeah. Um, so which implies that the code, which has typically always been the most valuable intellectual property right amongst these software projects, um, has to fundamentally be open. Uh, do you agree that for it to be decentralized, the code has to be on a GitHub that anybody can do a pull request on and stuff like that? Or do you feel like there is an opportunity to have a hybrid model of that? I, I think we have to have hybrid models if we want them to be successful. Uh, look, I remember when Vitaly Buterin uh, put out a, a fascinating article that really opened my eyes a lot because I was kind of just getting in this rabbit hole deep in this rabbit hole of like ZRX protocol and mm-hmm. what DEXs were going to be. And, uh, you know, looking at some of the governance of some of these projects that were popular in early 2018. Uh, and so he put out an article explaining decentralization. He showed different models of it. And here is the takeaway. Mm. Decentralization doesn't really exist. It's it's not really a thing. Like if you look and this, this might at first sound counter to what I was saying a second ago, but it, it actually doesn't. There's no such thing as 100% decentralization, and there's really no such thing as 100% centralization. There's a continuum where you have centralization on one side, and you have decentralization on the other side. Everything is going to fall on that continuum, and so when we talk about things that are going to be truly decentralized— we're talking about things that are going to fall much more on much more on the decentralized side of the continuum than the centralized uh, continuum. Here's a great example that that I thought about, like to try to portray this to people. Mm-hmm. Like, let's take let's make up a Dex. Like, let's call this uh, this Dex. We'll call it a Club Metaverse Dex dot com. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's say you didn't come up with this name. Let's say you had nothing to do with it, but Club Metaverse Dex dot com completely decentralized, 100% governed and ran by the users. Somebody had to build the website. Somebody had to come up with the name. Someone had to come up with the idea. So at some level, you're always going to have some kind of centralized idea, even for DAOs. Somebody's got to come up with the idea for the DAO. So it's not like we've got this collective consciousness and we're all just coming up with this stuff together. We can develop things together, but you initially have to have a level of decentralization and everything. So, you know, I I think that that is what we're going to see. We are going to see a hybrid. We want to see things fall mainly on the decentralized side of things. But then you also kind of run into problems of of groupthink and mob mentality, too, when Mm. all you need is is a... um, uh, a consensus of over 50% to make decisions. Well, you know, people aren't the best at making decisions and people tend to make the decisions. You know, if you look at retail investors on the market, they drive the market because of fear and FOMO and they're always doing the wrong thing, right? So the majority of retail investors are buying at the wrong time and selling at the wrong time. Just kind of like drives home the point that, you know, like self-governance is great and, and group governance is a, is great ideas, but that doesn't mean it's going to be perfect either. So I think falling somewhere, you know, more on the decentralized side of the continuum is a great thing. But, you know, Brendan Ike founded Brave Browser, you know, founded Basic Attention Token. So you're going right. to have some level of centralization that's going to have to creep into everything. And, and do you think that as a philosophy, entrepreneurs and engineers that are creating new projects should kind of buy into the idea that their code is not 
IP or, you know, that, that that's the part that I'm struggling with yeah. because like, e like even in the VR game that I'm building now, I ask myself, should I just let all the assets be public? You yeah. know, because if, if my um, game, you know, which has a token, um, if, if people using the assets that I'm building encourages other people to build on top of those assets and innovate on top of those assets without me having to finance it personally, and it increases the value of the token overall, then maybe that is a good equation, you know? Yeah. So, so it, yeah, so it's just really interesting because the paradigm shift isn't just happening on some ideological level or some governance level. It's happening on every single layer, you know? Well, I think I, I think to, to your point, I, I think it's a learning experience. You know, it, it's trial and error. We're gonna have to try it different ways and see what fits best. Mm -hmm. I, I think the IP conversation re regarding coding is a very important one. I mean, we we all know that Tron plagiarized the Ethereum white paper, right? I mean, that's common knowledge of this. But <laughs> they, they they plagiarized one section of it, but you know the other than the DPoS, um, you know the the Tron structure very similar to Ethereum. But, you know, I, I think it is one of these things where we are just going to have to see, like I said, it develop over time and, and people are going to have to try stuff. I mean, that might be a great thing for you to try, you know, like here on our YouTube channel, you know, we just decided we were going to stop doing all paid sponsorships and we we're also going to be giving away 100 percent of our YouTube money. Wow. Of, our, of our monetization, our YouTube ad monetization. So we keep 25% for taxes and then we're airdropping the other 75% to our NFT holders of Pluto Alliance. And oh it's God, like- that sounds incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if we go back to our November numbers, you know, that was, would have been us giving away like $120,000 about. So we're really big on giving money back, not as big now because, you know, attention is down in crypto, but it's experiment. That's my point. We're doing an experiment. We're trying something different. We're trying something outside the box because ultimately we think- down the road, doing this and continue to build the community is actually like better for us long term than the than the actual dollars we make per month are right now. And so it's just one of these things where I really encourage people to to come up with out of the box ideas that don't really make sense to people. That you're like, why would you do that? Sure. You know, come up with some things that that might be more beneficial down the road. And I think it just goes back to one of our investing philosophies. You know, d developing a long term mindset on stuff instead of uh, you know worrying about how much money you have day to day. As long as you get to a point where you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, you can pay your bills and stuff like that. Yeah. And to that point, somewhere around, God, I forget if it was 2017 or 2018, but, you know, um, Ethereum was at an all time high at the time and it was around 1200 bucks, 1300 bucks. And um, the biggest use case of Ethereum at the time was a site called uh, CryptoKitties. Yeah. Know, CryptoKitties had the biggest, you know, the highest level of usage. Mm -hmm. And I think that there was an actual panic in the industry because there it was, was all these it was all these products that had all this work and all this you know grand deals promised, but the only thing that was actually bringing in people was you know tradable cats, you know, with like seven or eight traits. And then of course we all know what happened, right? Yep. The price of Ethereum drops down to like ninety bucks or whatever it was, two hundred bucks. What you know, whatever. Seventy. It dropped to seventy. I think seventy bucks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and then you know, fast forward to twenty twenty one. It's the year of the NFTs. And, uh, you know, now it sounds like you're also involved in the NFT mm -hmm. space. I'm obviously involved in the F NFT space as well. Um, what What's your overall kind of take on this whole NFT culture? Yeah, I love it. I mean, it's going to be around. I, I think we're at a very immature stage of NFTs. We're going to be here for a while. I've, I, I'm, look, I am take part in it just like everybody else. I have a board ape. I have a crypto punk. Uh, you know, we have, as a company, we have some mutant apes. And, you know, of course, we have a lot of our, oh. our Pluto Alliance NFTs. So, so, sorry to interrupt you, but um, so for my game, we've modeled every single ape uh, trait so that we can procedurally uh, generate them. So yeah. if you ever come back on the show, you got to show me what your ape looks like and I can make, you know, and then you could be your ape on the show. Well, we call it the, the Easter bunny, the Easter bunny. That's with a TH. Uh, he's got bunny ears. Oh, got, oh, he's, oh, he's got the bunny ears. He's got okay. the bunny ears. So that's our, that's our, uh, you know, we, I say we have the fruitiest one, you know, for sure. So, and there are crypto punks, the one with the eye patch, but um, look, look, we love NFTs, but we're at a very immature time with mm. NFT. And, and I don't mean that like people buying them are immature. I just mean where NFTs themselves have not developed to where they're going to, they're going to become a much more serious thing. Mm -hmm. It's going to become where deeds and insurance and, sure. you know, uh, digital identification are all woven into NFTs. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about some cool stuff here at our work to make like basically where people scan in to get into our studio in NFT, you know, so wow. where you can only get in if you have an NFT. So 
you know, we're talking about a lot of the, the that stuff's going to come down the road. I mean, think about that. You don't have to give out a, a you know, a, a four digit code for your, you know, your door at work. You just say, Hey, if you work here, you have an NFT, you can come in. Right. Um, you know, kind of you think about like see, uh, schools with teachers, you know, they carry around those little cards they're around their neck. Like that card's an NFT. That's the only way you can get in. It solves a lot of problems. So I, I, I think that, uh, there's a lot of really cool use cases coming with NFTs. Right now, we think collectibles, we think monkeys, we think crypto punks, we think a lot of that stuff. But this is just the early stage, and and we're seeing a lot of development. You know, is it is it has to do with metaverse as well? Obviously, we're really big in metaverse. We have a whole channel, Meta Money, where that's oh. the whole focus. Oh, cool. And yeah, so and we have um, you know, we've got a lot of land in Sandbox. We have a whole city built in Sandbox. So we're oh, really nice. excited about that. We're trying to compete with Snoop for best land. So we'll see, we'll see what happens there. Uh I want to go to the Walking Dead land too. I want to try to dodge some zombies. But yeah, um, you know, I, we're we're all in on this. It, this is the kind of thing where this isn't really my forte. Like I'm not really I'm not a gamer. I guess that's the best way. I like to say, like, I'm not a nerd. Yeah, I don't do nerd things. You know? Right, right. I'm in crypto, so I'm kind of the king of the nerds. But I'm Sports also... are a little nerdy. Sports are a little nerdy. Uh, well, okay. I, I beg to differ. Especially if you're a Braves okay. fan. If you're a Braves <laughs> fan, you'll know, you'll know random shit about the Braves that nobody of knows. <laughs> yeah, of course. I will for sure. I, I, I am a sports nerd for sure. Uh, but you know, I, I'm just a regular guy. Like I, I I'm yeah. not, I'm not like, you know, super into like first person shooters or you know sure. Minecraft or anything. world of Warcraft. I've never, I, I've tried to play like seven times. I only make it 13 seconds each time before I realize I hate it. <laughs> right, right. So, so I, that's just not my forte, but I'm also smart enough to know that this is, this is the future, you yeah. know? And so I, I'm trying to stay as plugged into it as I can and uh, get more involved in it. But there is no question. We're, we're all, in a sense, we already all live in the metaverse with our phones. Like we're already sucked into a digital life. Sure. So you know, I definitely believe this is the future, a hundred percent. It's a strong direction we're going as a company for sure. Yeah, and, and like yeah, we're we're already all in the metaverse. And like the 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 original thought of the metaverse was introduced by Neil Stevenson in the novel Snow Crash. I don't know yeah. if you've ever read that book, but it, ha you know. haven't haven't read it. But I, I am familiar that uh, Ready Player One was not the the debut of the metaverse. Right, right, right. In Ready Player One, it's referred to as the Oasis. It's yeah. like, you know, they, they don't even use the terminology. But, you know, the the key thing that I think people need to embrace is that if they don't own what they bring to the metaverse, then they're not in a metaverse. They're just in another game that's using the buzzword, you know, right. and like that people really need to kind of, you know, um, embrace that idea or demand that service from the from, from the apps that they engage with that their value is being respected you know yeah. um no no that's that's um you know one thing that um i was thinking about as you were talking um you um because when somebody asks me what are nfts like this keeps changing, but like my little buzz line was like, NFTs have nothing to do with JPEGs. It's all about the community that the NFT represents, you know? Yeah. And you seem like a guy who's obsessed with building community that like you've discovered that that is the, you know, the way in. Um, and I wasn't even aware that you had so many other uh, channels, but, but you've yeah, built, we have, like we, have, we have six, six channels total, I believe. Okay, six channels, and you've built an entire community of people that you employ. I'm assuming, right? Like, like yeah, you have, have a full on. Oh yeah, we have we have forty thousand square foot uh, building we just moved into. Oh wow. Uh, we have uh, probably thirty five to forty people that work here every single day, and then we have another fifteen to twenty that are uh, remote. And and the future of your company is that all of the dollars that you traditionally got from the media business, you're going to give back to the community that helped you build it. And then you're going to monetize your business with with other ventures. Is that kind of yeah. like the big plan? Yeah. Well, we have one really big thing that we're working on right now that we can't really can't really talk about. It. It's under wraps, but no we worries. have one really big thing that we're working on. But you know, we already have like we already have enough money to run the business for years and years without having to bring in any more income. And oh, so, we, like I said, lucky. Yeah, we really look at stuff like long term. You know, we, we still have like a lot of private sale investment allocations that come in. We still have. You know, we still have affiliate money for the, that rolls in from different stuff for, you know, even from years ago. So we have, we have a lot going on where we still have income. It's our YouTube ads money specifically that we're giving away. But we just like we're in this for the long term. Like we're mm -hmm. still going to be here in 10 years from now. You know, we're not mm -hmm. going to we're not fly by night. We're not what I call the lazy millionaires club, which, you know, God bless them. A lot of the YouTubers from 2017, 2018, right, right. they got they got really rich and they got lazy. And, and we're not that we continue to work. We continue to grind. You know, we're hardest working channel in crypto. And, uh, you know, we're going to continue to be that for a long time. 
but we're just not in it for the short term. Like, I don't care about the dollars that are coming in today. I don't care about the dollars that are coming in this month. And to be honest with you, I don't care about the dollars that are coming in this year. Mm. I'm much more concerned with how we build this business to where instead of 50 people, we're employing a thousand people, you know, right. cause, cause here's the thing. One of the reasons why I do what I do is, uh, you know, I like to talk about this a lot. It's a big part of my story. I, I, I'm, I'm in recovery. I've been in recovery for 15 years. I've been sober for 15 years. Oh, congratulations. I, thank you. I, I was on hard drugs, you know, for seven years of my life, you know, teenage, early 20s. I overdosed. I almost died. And when I came back, I, you know, basically came back to life. Um, I went to rehab for two years. And so mm. ever since then, like my passion has been helping people. And that's what I, you know, help people get off drugs for a long time. But now, you know, I help people financially and helping people is the core of what we do here at Bitcoin mm, Crypto. It seems like that. It, it, but it's not just the people that watch the channel. Like, I love to help the people that watch the channel, but it's also we get to add on more families and more people that work here. You know, every person that works here, we're helping somebody get a job. We're helping them get established. We're teaching them social media. We're teaching them everything. We, we take that part of things really, really seriously as well, the way we treat our employees. So, um, you know, we, we're looking at ways that we can, you know, we don't want to be influencers. Like I'm not, I'm not opposed to the word influencer. I know there's a influenza, you know, it's so, so dumb. Like it just, it, an influencer just is what it is as a person with a platform, sure. but we really want to move from influence to impact. Like that's right, really right. what, what we're big on. Yeah. Um, I, uh, speaking of influence, one, one thing that I've, that I've had with the guests, because I have like, since I come from the media world, I've had a lot of like filmmakers on and, and physicists and stuff. But whenever I have uh, crypto folks on, I've been kind of, you know, workshopping this idea in my head of doing a bit on the show where I where I ape into a random coin. Um, last time I had Scaramucci on, he got me to ape into Algorand, okay. uh, which I, to be honest with you, I, I, I hadn't heard of, even though I'm a big really? crypto guy. I love yeah. Algorand, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like I haven't heard of. Is there anything out there that, that, that you're looking at that might be a low cap thing or something that you think has a huge ceiling? Well, when I look at the one that I believe is is the lowest that has the uh, the highest upside, um, I tend to le let let me just double check while we're we're here yeah, doing yeah, this. Yeah, let, me, yeah. let me just double yeah, check and make like sure it is the lowest. Because like one day maybe yeah. I'll have like actually a fancy graphic pass package yeah. and ape, <laughs> ape into something. Well, I think that one thing people have to do. I actually got a video coming out, um, you know, tonight. Uh, on this, the, the day that we're recording this, I don't know what day you're releasing it, but yeah. um, one thing that I'm real big on is infrastructure and crypto. And there mm -hmm. have been two, really, I would say, uh, look, Sandbox is definitely one. I I am so bullish on Sandbox. It's out of control. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, Yatsu was my last guest. He's yeah. a brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, absolutely. I've, I've had, uh, you know, the, the founder of, uh, of Sandbox on my channel before, like big fan of Sandbox. But there's two other coins that are more involved in the infrastructure of crypto mm -hmm. that that are I am a hundred percent convinced now are going to be here absolutely for the long term, and those are uh, FTT and uh, CRO. So Crypto.com, uh, Kronos, it's been rebranded to the coin of CRO. Yeah. Look, if you look at what FTT and CRO are doing in the NFT world, in the marketing world, in the sports world, in the trading world, in the staking world. They're just going to be around. I mean, FTX paid or uh, Crypto.com paid, uh, I think it was almost $800 million. It was at least $700 million for their sponsorship of the previous Staples Center where the Los Angeles Lakers and for now mm -hmm. the Los Angeles Clippers play. The will in the future, the now it's called Crypto.com Arena. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in Crypto.com already. I'm not in yeah. FTT. Yeah. Um, is that FTX? Is that similar? It is. Yes. It's, it's, it's the FTX token. It's the FTX utility token. Yeah. So. It, it's it's impossible to buy in the US without having to do some crazy, like, you know, other thing. And I tend I'm not to keep... sure where we, I'm not sure where we have it. I, I think it is available some places. It, definitely on decentralized exchanges, I believe you can get it. Yeah. 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 For sure. Um, yeah. I am, um, I'm with you on those two. Um, you know, FTX. Obviously, the um, the guy who's behind FTX is, ha, has been incredibly smart with marketing it in a mainstream way. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Crypto.com, you know, there's just something awesome about that. Yeah. Um, you know, it brings up a good, you know, question that I've asked a few people like Anthony Scaramucci and stuff like that, which is that there seems to be this kind of underlying political, politi politi uh, I'm Cuban, so it's hard for me to get my words <laughs> out, but you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I they, do. They they politicize uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh -huh. and they try to throw them into this kind of virtuous, you know, narrative. Are you a, a good person or are you like, you know, a fascist? 
and they tend to throw the crypto into the fascist side of the of the they equation. Yeah. Why do you think that is, especially when crypto is all about sovereignty and, and and like personal wealth and personal value? Well, it's really hard to broach this subject without getting political, but um, this is something I talk about on my channel a lot, and I've been mm -hmm. warning my my audience. The narrative is becoming Bitcoin is alt right, crypto is alt right. That mm -hmm. is the narrative that has been developing and brooding for some time now. If you look at the people that are the most ardent anti Bitcoin people in politics, you have Elizabeth Warren, you have uh, Sherrod Brown, mm -hmm. you have uh, Brad Sherman, uh, you have uh, 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 Rashida Tlaib. You have a lot. They're all on the Democratic side and right. when you really look at how they're shaping up like look it, it's so it's so crazy man and I've, I've been warning democrats for a while about this like sure. politicians if you go down this road you're going to lose because actually you can make a big strong argument that crypto lines up with liberal theology or not I, theology I, I, but liberal I, ideology a lot that's why i'm so confused about exactly. this whole incentive you know right, because here's here's the confusion point this this is why they're against it because it's untrackable and they want to control everything and track mm, everybody. Mm, That's what it's all about. That makes more sense. They, they love wealth redistribution, but they want to be in charge of it and they want to do it their way. They right. don't want it to happen naturally on their, on its own because then they're not going to be able to continue, you know, a, a lot of the things they do. Um, and a lot of the communities that they intentionally, you know, don't, don't help. So what, what I would say there is it is, I, I just tell people, look, if you're in crypto and this is a, something you're very big into, you know, I, I'm becoming a, a one issue voter on this. Like, I'm not mm -hmm. going to vote against my crypto ish, you know, crypto uh, best interests at all, because mm -hmm. this is what I do for a living. We need a lot of these politicians to wake up and realize they're going to be on the wrong side of history if, if they come out uh, uh, against this stuff. You know, they, they don't want to be Nancy Reagan and in, in the war on drugs. You know, we, we all right. they, they don't want to be, you know, George Bush and, and the Iraq war. You know, these, these are things that we generally consider as a as a whole as America. Like these were big failures. You know, there, there are many people who tell you the Iraq war is a failure or a success or the drug war is a success. Being anti crypto is definitely going to fall into that kind of basket where if they continue to speak out against crypto and, and push it to the fringes then they're going to look really dumb in the future and they're going to lose a lot of power and influence. So, you know, it's very frustrating to me to see it turn into this, but this is something I actually predicted years ago. I predicted years mm. ago that we would see one side or the other take this and try to make this a political issue and pin pin Americans against each other because that's what they do. Uh, you know, we any anything that is a big issue in America, it becomes a political issue where if you line up with this party, you believe this. If you line up with right. this party, you believe that. And it, it's just time for us to break that. And so, um, you know, you think about all the positive blockchain stuff can do for politics. You know, if you look at blockchain voting, you know, they don't want that right. coming in there. You know, right. that'll, right. that'll, that'll really <laughs> clean stuff up. So. Yeah, and 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 it seems that the like the entry point. I, I first started sniffing out. You were on it way earlier than I was because I always kind of agreed with you. Uh, back when the first regulation started happening around ICOs, um, it, it seemed to me like it was kind of a you know uh, both parties were kind of into the idea of creating the regulations around yeah. crypto, but. I started sniffing it out when they started kind of throwing crypto under the bus for being bad for the environment, you know, that, that, so that, 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 that yeah. Bitcoin mining is bad for the environment to the point where even uh, Elon Musk, you know, had his little, you know, hissy fit online and pulled, you know, crypto from being able to buy the cars and all that stuff. And it just seemed like to coincide with that kind of narrative of the whole, yeah. you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, bad for the environment thing. Is there any truth to that as somebody who's not really super versed in how much energy it takes? Is is there any truth to that at all? Or is that a complete fabrication or is kind of half somewhere in between? Well, 10% uh, of all electricity in the world. Do you know what it is? 10% of all electricity in the world. No, I do not know what it is. Air conditioning. Mm, that makes sense. But But why do we not? get rid of air conditioning because it's a net positive for the world because it makes right. things easier. It makes things better. Here are some things that take up more energy usage than Bitcoin. Gold mining, 
physical banks. Okay. So right. when we look at this and you try to say like, okay, you know, where does it fall on the scale? Like, yeah, it takes up energy for sure. Sure. But it's, but it's a net positive and, and actually using that electricity is kind of what, you know, from a cryptographic standpoint makes Bitcoin a, a, a private secure network. And that's really what we like about it. When you move to proof of stake, it does come, it becomes more about who already has a lot as opposed to any person can set up a Bitcoin miner today, 400 bucks, order yourself a small ASIC and you can start making Bitcoin. Now it might not be that much. It might not be profitable, but you can generate a stake in the network with, with, with POS. You, you can't do that. Now, eventually if the climate, the climate crazies get too crazy, you know, then, you know, maybe the cries for Bitcoin get so loud that it is possible for Bitcoin to, to switch to proof of stake. Not something that I want to see happen. I was very encouraged by the last meeting they had, uh, you know, in Washington regarding mm -hmm. climate change or uh, regarding Bitcoin mining. And they were actually a little more positive. Here's the thing. When you look at Tesla, Tesla over time has gotten more environmentally friendly because it's been given that bandwidth and that room and that gap and that, um, you know, the ability to be able to to do that. Bitcoin over time has also been getting more environmentally friendly, but using renewable energy sources, basically using energy that wouldn't be used anyways, right. but it already exists. Then why is it not afforded the same, the same right, the same slack? Slack was the word I was trying to think of earlier. The, right. the word slack, the, the same slack that Tesla has gotten. So overall, Bitcoin mining, it does take up energy. People that try to use arguments regarding uh, NFT environmental impact, they're crazy. Like you're, <laughs> you're, you're really stupid if you actually believe that uh, NFT carbon footprint is big enough to make a big deal about. You, you need to shut your air conditioning and your lights off and light candles if, if that's where you're at. <laughs> but Bitcoin mining, it, it is an issue. It does take up a lot of energy, but it's not nearly what they make it sound like. So most of what you're right. hearing is not true. I, I, if you were to compare it to uh, a city usage the entire bitcoin network uses about the same electricity per day that las vegas uses right. so las vegas got some lights okay it's definitely got some lights but where are the people calling for the shutdown for las vegas and a lot of people would say you know i love las vegas i, I played in the wsop i'm big poker player you oh, know oh, just, okay nice yeah. nice so I got 135th in the main event for the World Series of Poker this year. Oh wow! So I'm really excited about that. Okay, yeah, so you're a real poker run. player. Yeah, I was the I was the chip leader on day five, the day I busted out. But I, anyways, I, I and I went out with pocket aces all in pre flop. So oh yeah, it's tough. It, the clip's out there somewhere. People want to go find it. But <laughs> right. uh, but 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 the point here is, I think I, a lot of people would say Las Vegas is a net negative. <laughs> you know, like it right, brings in right. a lot of money, but it brings in a lot of money for the casinos. Uh, a lot of debauchery happens there and stuff like that. So if you want to shut down Bitcoin mining, I want to see you outside Las Vegas holding the sign. Yeah, you know, basically bottom line, it just seems like, it seems like, you know, propaganda to try to demonize something that they just can't really control. And then like, you know, the other thing that I always hear, um, especially with this hack that just happened, uh, God, I forget the exchange that it happened on, but this hack where the government seized uh, uh, over a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin or whatever. Bit Bitfinex, $4 billion. Yeah, Bitfinex. Um, you know, it's like, oh, your crypto's not safe. Your crypto's not safe. They can take it whenever they want. Uh, well, if that's true, Satoshi has a million Bitcoin in a wallet that no one's ever been able to touch. Yeah. I believe it's like in five wallets. It's spread across like five or six wallets or something. And no one has ever been able to move that, you know, those coins, you know? And I bet you that there's people, entire cities of hackers that all they do is wake up every day and try to hack into Satoshi's wallet. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sure that exists. I, I think the thing to think about there when it comes to talking about the security of uh, of Bitcoin and of crypto wallets and we look at a lot of these exploits, people have this idea that hackers are real smart, that they're mm -hmm. like that they're like these geniuses from this movie that are back there on a computer just tap, 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 tap. <laughs> right. And, you know, they're, they're breaking into back doors and they're doing all this stuff. Ninety nine percent of hacking is fishing. You know, right. it's not right. Right. It, it's not exploiting things. It's exploiting the psychology of humans to get them to give you what you need to get in. Right. That's what, right. that's what hackers are really good at. So if, you know, Canada talking about we're freezing Bitcoin, we're freezing, but no, you're not. You're, you're telling a, a, a company that if they send the Bitcoin, they're in trouble. Like that's what you're telling them. They're blacklisting right. addresses on regulated exchanges. So that way the exchanges are in trouble if they allow the users to, to exchange on, on their side, if it's, if it's black mark and things like that. You can't freeze Bitcoin. That's the whole beauty of it. 
if you could get into a wallet or you could freeze Bitcoin, the entire Bitcoin network would go down in a day. Mm. You know, so it's not possible. Quantum computing is way further off than people think. Um, so, you know, eventually, you know, changing from shot 56 to something, you know, higher encryption will probably have to happen. But, um, you know, we're, we're a ways away from that. And I look, first of all, we're, we're already 55 minutes in and I want to be, uh, you know, careful with your time because you've been so generous with it. Um, one last thing that I want to ask you, and it's almost like a personal question, um, is, you know, I've, I've been a lifelong or lifelong, but I've been a crypto lifelong a user of of Coinbase. You know, it's always mm -hmm. been very easy to to buy my crypto there. It's always been very easy to liquidate my crypto. It's a great service. You yeah. know, I aped into the damn IC, you know, IPO way too hard. I lost, you know, more than half my money on that one. Yeah. Um but, you know, so I'm a Coinbase user. It's just the reality of it. Mm -hmm. I keep most of my portfolio on there. I probably shouldn't say that here because there're probably people fishing for that right now, but um do you do you think that that like as you're giving people the advice, the people that are coming up in your community, do you recommend keeping hardware wallets or do you think that the whole software wallet infrastructure is strong enough to be safe? Look, I think I think my uncle Brian over there at Coinbase, I think he uh, he knows what he's doing. All right, it's, Brian, it's a great, I'll go uh, Uncle Brian. That's what that's what we call him on the channel, Uncle Brian. There's so. no relation, right? Because I've no. actually thought about that. Okay, <laughs> no, there's yeah, yeah, there, yeah. There, there's no relation between yeah, the two yeah. of us. But yeah. it's uh it's a fun nickname. I like fun nicknames. You know, Janet no telling yelling or Janet fell and yelling as I call oh, yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then of course we got uh, you know Dirty Gary Ginsler and oh, we got yeah, Uncle yeah. Brian. You know, these are our people. Uh, look, this is what we tell our people: don't use one strategy diversify your strategy you don't mm. just diversify your portfolio you diversify strategies across uh you know a, a large part of what you're doing in crypto don't have one place where you have your crypto we do suggest keeping money on exchanges if you're going to be trading it at all and you're not just playing to hodl for 10 years but that should be a percentage of your portfolio uh you know you should have a hardware wallet it, it, bare minimum you should have one just so you know how to use them in case you do which, need which it. one do you recommend which one ledger, do you recommend? ledger we like ledger we know they had the privacy hack that involved uh it involved data like home addresses and stuff like that but the actual tech of the of the device has never been hacked uh trezor is another good one we like arculus uh pretty good Th those are some ones that we do like mm -hmm. um but you know, we suggest I use Ledger. It's what I use. I've got you know both kinds of ledgers: Ledger X and uh, Ledger uh, Nano S. But you know, that's just one strategy. Then have some hot wallets. You know, some wallets that are you know on your the Coinbase wallet is really good. I like not the Coinbase app, the Coinbase wallet. Yeah, it's Coinbase separate, wallet. I use that too. I use that too. You have your private keys. You own your crypto. It's a higher level of custody. We want people to understand all three levels of custody. You got your Robinhood custody and your PayPal custody, where you literally do not own your crypto at all. You can't even get it off. Then you have your Coinbase level, your centralized exchange level, where technically you do own it, but you don't own the private key. So the only way, you know, to really, you know, say you have ownership is to have a private key. But if you want to move it to a place where you have the private keys, you can. So that's kind of the second level. And then, of course, the third level is complete self-custody where you own your own private key. We want people to move there to self-custody, but mm -hmm. it is good. Coinbase Vault is great. That's if you're going to store your 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 uh, crypto on the Coinbase app, definitely use Coinbase Vault. It's a way to enable basically, uh, you know, you have to have two email authentication before you can do a withdraw uh, or a transfer out of there. Uh, and then I think it's 24 to 36 hours, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but so basically someone can't SIM card swap. You do it in five minutes and be done with it. Right. Uh, you know, there's a hold on it. So well, if is that you a really thing, SIM card swap? Is that like a thing? Oh, yeah. SIM card swapping is the number one way people get hacked in crypto. That's not phishing. Uh, this is this is it is almost a form of phishing. It's where basically organized crime works within people that work at phone companies, like someone that works at AT&T, they pay them per account and they will port over their numbers and the SIM card over to a different phone. And then wow. all of a sudden that person has access to your email, access to your, all your text messages, access to your, you know, everything but two factor authentication basically. Wow. And so that's how, you know, Michael Turpin, uh, uh, a big billionaire guy, he had all his money taken. Uh, he actually won, I think it was a hundred and twenty million dollar lawsuit against AT&T over it. So that's how he lost. I think it was twenty five million dollars, something like that, oh. that he lost. in a hack. basically there was a guy at consensus that went and SIM card swapped six people that were there at consensus. And I think twenty eighteen or twenty nine, I think it was twenty eighteen and basically stole millions and millions and millions of dollars of crypto off of all of them. But here's the point. 
don't have all your crypto in one spot. You know, that that's right, the most right. important thing that, uh, you know, I can stress to people. Well, man, is there anything like any parting words of wisdom for the future, man, be, be, before we go here? I mean, I feel like we've gotten so much great yeah. info from you, Ben. I, I, I really appreciate it. any any final words. Well, what I would say is crypto is, you know, kind of the new space exploration. It's the new internet. You know, this is mm -hmm. something that there's going to be a lot of opportunities. And I really encourage everybody, you know, one of our investing philosophies at BitBoy Crypto is become an expert. It doesn't mean become an expert on everything in crypto, but pick something and go with it. If you want to be an expert in NFTs, if you want to be an expert in trading, if you want to be an expert in staking and yield farming and ways to generate passive income, find something in crypto where you can generate income outside of just investing. Um, I think that's a really good way for you to stake your claim in blockchain. Encourage everybody to do that. It can be metaverse. You know, uh, that's something we're real big on as well. We also have the BitLab Academy, BitLab, uh, bitlabacademy.com. This yep. is our, our education site. We've got beginner, intermediate, expert level uh, content there created by, you know, Nicholas Merton from Data Dash did a course for us. We have a lot of different courses in there for people that have been in crypto, you know, for, you know, almost 10 years. A lot of the people that, that write courses for us. So definitely something to check out if you're looking to, you know, get your, you know, um, get your feet wet and uh, get going in crypto is a great place to start. Cool, man. Well, it's Monday through Friday, 1130 a.m. East um, EST the BitBoy Crypto Show. It really does feel like that moment when you get to the office and you just kind of hang around all your buddies and talk about what happened the it night does. before. Yeah, um, That's really the format and it's really welcoming and I really appreciate you. And I, I'm so honored I got a chance to meet you, man. And like if we ever chat again, you should give me your ape number and I'll make you a custom okay, three, sure thing. Uh, you know, ape avatar for you, brother. Awesome, man. We'll be down. We'll be down in, uh, in, in Miami uh, for Bitcoin uh, 2022. If you're going to be down there, I'd love to, to hang out. Oh, man, I'm definitely going to be here. Yeah. I will send you all my contact, and I'd love to buy you uh, um, a water. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great, man. I appreciate that. All right, cool. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks. I really appreciate it. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.